everyone. My name is Adrian. I'm a marketing analyst at Arc Foods. So we're like a specialty produce firm. Um, today I'll be covering the environment chapter. Um, the one note about this, this chapter gets a little like a little deep, like kind of in the weeds of how the internals of art works. Um, Hadley mentioned the book that like you won't be using this from day to day, but there are a few like your concepts that we'll use in future chapters that rely on some of the information here. So I think maybe take away like the big picture from this um, chapter, but there are a lot of like technical things I'll go over, which may or may not uh, really uh, be necessary. Any questions before I started? Oh, okay. So if we recall from chapter six, R has four primary scoping rules. So like when it's trying to evaluate uh, like if you call A, like 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 where is it where is it uh, trying to find A from? So the first rule is name masking. So anything that's defined inside a function will mask names outside the function. So then if R can't find that name, then it'll look like one level up, so like one level outside the function. Um, another rule is that it uses prefers functions versus variables. So if you use a name in the function call, the objects are, that aren't functions will get ignored like in that search. Um, and also a fresh start just means that every time the function is called, a new environment gets created. So we're gonna see here, like we're gonna talk about environments a lot, but basically if you call a function one way, so like with one argument, you're gonna create an environment with that specific argument in it. And then if you call it again, with either the same argument or a different argument, it's gonna create a new environment there as well. So you're not gonna be able to like, reference what you just uh, got from a function unless you're like very really explicit about it, which we'll see um, later. Um, then looking at dynamic lookup, R will basically look for values only when it needs it. And we'll see that when we uh, start looking at the call stack. Um, call stack basically is just like shows you like how the function is being called in a stack. Um, but the dynamic lookup will show you how R is doing that specifically. Um, okay. So then so the most important thing you need to know, like what's the definition of an environment? Um, an environment's job is just to bind a set of names to a set of values. So basically it's kind of like, if you think about all the values as uh, like Skittles, like uh, it could be like in a bag. There's, there's no uh, necessary order to it. Every name has to be unique um, and every environment has a parent. And so what happens is environments aren't copied when they're modified. So instead they just reference themselves, they reference the object inside themselves. Um, so like if you have an object in a global environment, for example, which you're probably used to when you're looking at our studio on the side, um, when you change a variable there, you're just modifying the variable. It doesn't copy over. So you don't have two copies of the same variable when you modify. That's pretty typical behavior you should expect. It to be. Yeah, environment is just a collection of different names. Um, there are two ways you can make an environment. Um, one way is just to do use rlang um, uh, env or new dot env. And then one way, a few ways to like view the environment is just if you use the rlang function and you just use environment print. And that gives you a little bit more in descriptive information about the environment. And then um, environment names also gives you a list of the bindings, the things inside the environment. And then names just gives you well, what the current uh, bindings are. This is typically not encouraged to use because it doesn't give you as much information, but uh, the book kind of says to use environment print. Uh, this tutorial is kind of interactive, so you'll be able to like type in code and stuff and we want to see what the results are. So that should be helpful as well. So this is an example environment. So it's just called E1 for environment one and it has a few different um, things inside of it. So like a logical, a string vector, um, a double and like a numeric. And then if we click on this, actually, um, if we go to the next page, we'll see, we'll, we'll start using some um, functions with this E1 here. So if you want to create a new environment, all you need to do is just call that code that we have here. And then if I called rlang to print the environment, this is what, uh, this is the information that we'd have. If we just had, if we just, if we try to print names, for E1, then we would see here that we just have the names, so like A, B, C, and D. But it doesn't tell you any more uh, information. So that's why 
uh, you want to use environment print because it gives you all this information. So like what the environment is, the reference, and then what its parent environment is, uh, like right above, and then what the bindings are. So you can tell you that A is logical, et cetera, et cetera. Moving on, if we wanted to uh, see if two environments were the same, we would actually need to use the identical um, operator. And so the identical operator would tell you whether two things are the same. Um, your current environment is where your code is currently executing. So that might be inside of a function, it might be outside of a function, but basically wherever the the function wherever the uh, variables are currently being loaded that's what your current environment is and then your global environment is just kind of like your workspace um, oftentimes they're the same but in this example because it's running on like a server these won't be the same like if you run in your actual r code this will show um, up as being the same but um, that's just an important thing to note if you want to see like if two things are um, in the same environment uh, one thing to note here, as we'll see, is that environments all have parents. So this is one environment here. This box has like A, B, and C, and then it points to a parent environment, which has D and E. So this is how R is able to find names. It actually looks recursively. So it starts at the bottom and tries to go all the way up. What happens is it ends up at the empty environment. The empty environment it's kind of like the stopping point. So there's nothing else in there because it's empty. It doesn't, it doesn't have a parent environment. So that's just one thing uh, to note. The most of the times what you'll find is that uh, most of your functions will just stop at the global environment, and there's a bunch of stuff in between the global environment and the empty environment. And we'll and we'll see what that is uh, in a second. The thing about the empty environment is that. Sorry, the thing about the parent environment is that they can be set at a time of creation. And then if you don't do that, then just the current environment will be used otherwise. So you can actually set something. Like if you had a new environment that you want to set, you can actually skip this environment and just go to the environment that has D and E in it. You could also call the parent environment just by using either env underscore parent or parent.env. So in here, I have a few examples. So in this example, we're creating a new environment here. So it's called E2A. So it has like a few things, so like uh, D and E. And then the second environment, E2B, the parent environment is called E2A. And so if you want to here look at what the um, sequence of environments are, what you do is you would just call environment parents for E2B, and that would have what this is here, uh, the environment uh, for A, and then the parent environment that A has, and then it goes up to the global environment. And then here, I have the same function for just A. So A is in reference B. And so we'll see if that, um, oh, sorry, Hans, you had a question? So the reason why there's a empty environment is because every, basically every, uh, R has to basically look through each environment in order to find out where the values are. And then it has to stop somewhere. So that's why we have the empty environment. Um, they actually, most of the time, like your, most of the time, like R will stop at the global environment. And then there's a bunch of stuff in between that. Uh, like all the packages are in between uh, the global environment and the empty environment. So there won't necessarily, like you won't necessarily, like the empty environment is not like the, the real stopping point, the stopping point should be the global environment. Um, for, sorry, does this example make sense? So A references B, and then if you look at what the parents are for B, it includes uh, A and then the parent for A and then the global. And if we just look at A, it has a parent for A and then just the global. So then yeah, here's my note about the empty environment. It's empty because it doesn't have a name. And then the, the kind of like the incorrect mental model should think about environment uh, is contained within its parent, but really it's more like 
the environment points to the parent. So it's actually just looking at, okay, what's the next point that I need to um, look at before I get to the, in this case, the global environment um, for most of for most of your day to day. For some of the people that came in, like this chapter talks a little bit about a few technical things, but um, they mentioned that you won't really be using a lot of this information in your day to day, but it's it'll be helpful when looking at some of the more complex um, stuff. Okay. So you'll see here, this is uh, what I was referring to. If you actually have those same two uh, environments that I mentioned um, previously, we can actually force it to actually stop at the empty environment. When we run this code, what you'll see is before it stopped at the global, right? But then what's actually happening under the hood is that all the packages are being loaded after the global environment. Then we have what this package called auto loads. Auto loads always, um, auto loads and base are always there. Auto loads are just for all your packages, um, for all the, the um, data sets. It basically just looks at data sets and then it pulls them out whenever they need to. And then the base package is always loaded. And if you open up R, um, so that's always loaded um, together, auto loads and the base package. And then the empty environment is last. So the base points to empty. So basically all this stuff here from four to 15, you're not necessarily working with, um, like nothing's being saved here. Um, it's just that everything else before um, the global environment, everything else just gets saved all the way up to the global environment. And then anytime you load a package, it's gonna be loaded in this section. Okay. So when we look, uh, next, we have this um, idea of called like a super assignment. A super assignment is basically has two arrows as opposed to like the one arrow that you use for assignment. And what this does is it never creates a new variable in the current environment. Instead, it looks for a variable in the parent environment to modify. This environment or this behavior is not necessarily desirable because if you if you use this within a function, then it's going to start to modify things outside the function. So can anybody guess what this function is going to return? Like if x is defined to be zero um, outside the function and then inside the function, it's super assigned to one, um, what would the end result be? Um, advanced question. So, um, so why do we use super environment, uh, super assignment? So here, if we use just simple assignment, x is equals to one, won't it modify the X from the outside? Okay, they are not in the same environment, right? If we they're just- not. Use... They're not, yeah. So this is so this X is in a different it environment. It would be one, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. No, no. All right, let me get, get rid of this. I don't know, okay. Yeah, so it would be one. Yeah, so that, that that's a good, that's the right thinking. So it's actually gonna change with this X is outside. Um, really, if you didn't uh, super assign it, so we just had it yes. one, it would actually be zero. Okay. So the, the chapter said that you don't want to do this because like you said, like it's going to change it and give you different results than what you're expecting, but it's helpful in chapter 10, whenever we create function factories. I'm not sure what that is exactly, but they said that this, this is when you would use that. For function so like a function of a function. It would be, um, so essentially when, you're, when you are developing a function, it creates its own environment and everything inside of the functions environment, um, you can assign whatever it is. But when you call X or you call any variable outside, if it's not already predefined in the global environment, then it's gonna return null. So like if X wasn't already predefined and you only do a simple assignment, then it's gonna have, X is gonna have a null value. And then, but because you did a super assignment, X will, always be one in this in this case yeah so yeah, i'm not sure you can actually uh, to brett's question like what if you take out the, uh, the super assignment i guess it does push it up i guess i guess that does make sense like it's still going to find a pair um, environment which in this case would be the global environment of like this code it's right still going to modify it but i think if we get rid of this i think this will be null yeah, I think that will throw an error. Something is wrong. 
don't know. This Maybe the environment of this uh, code example <laughs> is yeah. holding one. <laughs> Yeah, maybe it's holding one. I'm not entirely sure. Um, so for, for environments, you can use uh, the traditional getting and setting operators on them. Um, you can use the dollar sign or the double, the double brackets, uh, similar to list. But what you can't do is you can't use the double brackets with numbers. So you can't look for the first um, object in an environment because like I said before in the beginning like environments are just like bags of candy like you can never oh yeah you can never um there is no order to anything so you can't like um call things by their indices also you can't use the single bracket um, when you're calling uh, something from an environment uh another thing to know is that dollar sign and the double brackets will return null if the mind doesn't exist and then binding a name to null won't delete it. Um, I'm not sure what it will do, but it, I just know that you won't be able to delete um, a name just because you um, set it to null. And then there are a few more functions. So um, environment poke, you'll be able to add something to your environment, like one thing at a time. But if you want to add multiple things, you could just do environment bind. And then if you want to check if something Within the environment, you can just do environment has. And then lastly, if you want to actually remove something, then from the environment, you can just do environment unbind. So I'll show you a few examples of what that looks like. So a few examples of subsetting. So we'll have E3. So this environment was X equal to one, Y equal to two. Uh, if you want to get what X is, you can use, use the dollar sign. If you want to add something like if you want to add Z here, you could also do that. And then you could also try to find it. Well, actually, hold on. Let me show you here. All three of these will work. So when you look here and you want to see what X was, X will return one. Um, but then all three of these won't work. Right. So if you want to find out what uh, E3 of Z was, you're going to get three down here. And then these two won't work because you can't reference it by a number and you can't reference anything with a single bracket. Yeah, so these, yeah, these two won't work. Because I'm saying- Can you repeat the number. last statement you just said with the double brackets? So the double brackets here, so for an environment, doesn't have indices. So like X isn't in the first position, Y isn't in the second position, oh, X just exists gotcha. in there. So you can't just subset it uh, to one and you also can't use a single bracket for the same reasoning. Single brackets also use uh, uh, indices like behind the hood to like look for things. So you can only use um, the dollar sign? Either the dollar sign or the double bracket with a name. So it has to be, okay, so it has to be named. Right. And you Sorry. can only call it by name. Yeah, these these three work and then these two don't work. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, why why do we even use environment to create something not a list? Why, why the essence of using the environment here? What does it make and when do we use it? So I saw that we use the environment for a few things. One, for like I mentioned earlier, the, the function factories. If you want to have a function that calls another function, you can use the environment there. They also talked about a few object-oriented things like R6 and other, um, other more advanced topics um, with the environment. I think also if you're trying to, I, I, think, I think it's most useful when, when you're trying to understand what, what happens with a function, like whether or not you want to modify things afterwards or if you want to keep them yeah so in this sense um i'm, I'm just looking um, at practical sense when we create um, this environment to create something like this and try to index it in this way um i'm not entirely sure uh when you might use this um, 
Okay. But I think, yeah, I think this is just covering like all, all the bases. Okay. When you need. Yeah, sure. Um, the examples here kind of just show if you want to add bindings. So similar to, uh, up there to E3, if I want to uh, I want to add something called A, for example, to the environment. I could just run environment poke. And then A is just going to be 100 here. And then if I want to bind multiple things, so like A equal to 10, and then B equal to 20, if I try to find what the names were, um, you'll have X, Y, A, and B. So X, Y, A, and B. Those are all the names there. And then if I want to see if the environment contained A, I would use environment has. If I try to put back to what I was saying before, like if you try to set it to null, it's still going to show up. So that's what this is here. But the only way to actually remove something from the environment is to use environment unbind. And then once I call that, um, and I call environment has again, at that point, then it's false. Yes, Hans made a good point. Um, We'll talk about it in a second as well. Like for, for packages, the environment uh, plays a big role. There's going to be a lot of like confusing diagrams, but um, I think the important thing to remember is that like environments are basically collections of bindings, um, and just like bindings are basically like collections of different values, and you can basically control like when you can access those values. So one thing to know about environment bind is that it uses delayed bindings. So it's evaluated the first time it's ask it's accessed. Um, this is helpful for the auto load package. So this package allows you to use data sets almost like they were already loaded in your computer, even though they actually weren't. Um, and that's and they're actually like a promise like in disguise. A promise is just kind of like a something that's delayed. I think we talked about it last week. Promise basically is just saying, show you an example. Um, here, um, when we call environment bind lazy, so like using lazy evaluation, basically when we want um, the function to run the first time, it's going to wait for one second, then it's going to print one. And then once it's done that once, then it won't do it again. So if we run this code, What we'll see is it's going to print out one after one second. So this is showing you one second that it's uh, taken to do this. And then it's going to actually print out one again, but it's not going to take any time to do that because it's only evaluating once. It takes zero seconds to do it because it's already storing that value of one. And then active bindings are different because they recompute each time they're accessed. So here's an example of an active bind. So what we'll do is we'll run it once. Oh, hold on. There we go. So what happens is it'll run once if we call an active bind, but then if I brand again, it's going to give us a different number because it's active. It's going to be recomputed each time. Uh, whereas before, if, if, if we did lazy, they would only compute once, and then it would just give us the same number. I was here for a second oh. <clears throat> because I, I wanted to ask about um, so delayed bindings and active bindings. Um, you said that delayed bindings are useful for auto load pack. <clears throat> excuse me, auto load package. Does this have anything? I, I mean, maybe you may be able to answer, but anybody else on the call, does this have anything to do with like package development and binding variables? I don't know if you guys have experienced that 
annoying warning that comes up when you try and publish a package, uh, build a package, and you have variables in your package that need to be binded? Yeah, so that's actually- Is this related? That is related. So when we talk about namespaces in a little bit, it's gonna show you um, okay. why okay. that's important. Yeah, it needs, basically it just, yeah, I'll show you. Yeah, basically it's like name clashing. Like certain packages have the same names for functions and you need namespaces in order to resolve that. And it needs to be bound, it needs to be bound. Um, to bound to, bound to, um, what environment? Sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit confused on the binding. So for, um, like the package environment? I can go back to the, the, the image that I have here in a second, but at least to my understanding, yeah, it's the package. Like there are multiple environments uh, in a package and it's kind of gonna go through like a bunch of, it's gonna go through like a, a lot of paths before you actually use it um, as the end user. Basically the developer is the one who determines mm -hmm. uh, what the, the environment will be like when you use a package. It's not you that actually determines that. Um, and you'll see like what the, like I think the picture will make a little bit more sense. So they kind of had this here, just like a recursive um, definition for going over environments, like basically checking um, if something is in the current environment. Uh, this is basically used to determine, yeah, this is basically used to determine like what environment uh, your, either your variable or other um, function is in. So I don't know if, is there, I don't know if everybody's, uh, familiar with like recursion, they have like two examples here. Uh, this function called where is able, you're able to basically take a name and then take an environment. This call an environment we'll talk about in a second. Uh, basically there's a base case. So basically if you're already at the empty environment, then you just stop and you say you're at the, you can't find it. Or you try and check to see if the environment that you're at right now, so the call environment, has your package or your name, and then you get success. Otherwise, it will call the function again. So what this means is it's going to come back up here, and it's going to start here again. So a good example of this is if we went down here and we asked where is y y y. It doesn't know where that is, so it's going to return error. But if I called X to be five, and I ask where X is, it's gonna say it's in the current environment. But if I ask where the main package is, it's gonna, one, look at the current environment, find that it's not there, and it's gonna keep going up until it hits the base environment. Um, and that's gonna give us our answer. Right, so this one can't find why, why, why. And then for these two, it just looks at the current environment. And then this one for mean, it just looks and finds it at the base. And then there's like an iterative implementation. So basically it just means like it's not recursive. So Brett said uh, nesting isn't the right mental model for environments. Yeah, I mean, they had this here. I think it's kind of like more like an aside that they had here, like a little section, but I thought it would be helpful uh, to include it. Yeah, and they also did mention that the iterative, iter, iterative one is more confusing, but for someone who may not be familiar with recursion, this might be um, like a good starting point uh, for them. Okay. I think, I think this image was really helpful when I was trying to understand this chapter. Basically, it shows that um, this thing called like a search path. Basically, like how does R search for what you're calling? So if you call A, like how does R go through? Uh, basically, like the implementation of that where package. Uh, what happens is every time you attach a package, it becomes a part, a parent of that global environment. Um, 
And then the most recently attached package becomes the immediate parent of a global environment. So if I attach package D, it would be global environment, then it'd be D, then C, then D, then A. Um, and that search path is kind of like that sequence of the environments that, um, that R takes until it hits the base environment and then it hits the empty environment. Yeah, this, this would be an example of scoping. Um, so most of the time, your functions will only uh, be referenced all the way up to the global environment, but technically it does, uh, if it can't find the global environment, it will go up all the, it'll go up all the packages um, up until base and then up until the empty environment. And then that's when we'll say like, you can't find it. Um, these last two packages here, they're always going to be auto loads and base. So these two are always the same. Um, and if you want to see uh, the full list of environments, then you could always use that uh, using search or using the search environments. Um, part. Okay. So then now we have something else a little confusing for me, and maybe somebody might be able to be able to also give some insights to this. Basically, you have this idea of what's called like the function environment. So a function binds the current environment where it's created. So that means that that becomes the environment that the function sees, so like the, the scope. And then across all computer languages, functions that you know, enclose that environment, they're called closures. So that's oftentimes why they might interchange those two terms, like functions and closures with um, functions and closures in the R documentation. And typically the name is bound to the function unless it's anonymous, in which case uh, then it won't be. But we'll also find that, that the environment in which the name is bound is not necessarily the environment that the function binds. This last part was a part that confused me. So I took an excerpt from the book. So it says like in this example I'm gonna show you, um, if you look down here, the first example, I think it's pretty easy to understand. So if we see that Y is equal to one in the global environment, and then F is a function also defined in the global environment. It's a func this is a function um, representation. And basically this function is bound uh, to the global environment. And then the value X is also bound to the global environment. But in this case, E is a new environment but G, E is a new environment and G is bound to it. But then when we look at the function itself, it's like, so like G is calling one, which is actually found here in the global environment. It's actually referencing another environment. So the example in the book, it says in the following example, G is bound to a new environment E, but the function G binds the global environment. So basically it's connected to the global environment. And then the distinction between binding and being bound by is subtle but important. The difference is how we find G. So basically, what we do to find G here, that's how we search it, versus how G itself finds its variables. So while G is connected here, the function itself is connected to the global uh, environment. Sorry, so G is, in, G is inside E. Um, the function itself is connected to the global environment. If this part was like kind of confusing. I was kind of like rereading it. But did anybody have another way of thinking about this? No. Okay. I don't understand what it means by how G finds its variables. In this case, so. How does G? find variables. So in this case, like at least how I understood it, I think they were referring to the, the search path because it was like right immediately before. So like so like um in the base package or in yeah in the base package there are like certain constants or like off the top of my head or um, functions that I think if you just called it like mean for example like mean you don't have to like load a package. Um, in order to just launch mean because mean is already loaded um, when you first uh, have R. So this example, I'm trying to think of a way to, to connect those two. I think that when I, when I see this, I see that G, 
is G is like we can see that G is in the environment it's called E. Like E points out to this environment, even though it's, it's in an environment of itself. Um, but then the function itself points to a value in the global environment. So maybe if like maybe if you oh so maybe if you wrote um, maybe you wrote your own function and inside that function you called the mean function. Right, the mean function is a part of the base, um, the base environment, and so you're calling something that's not in your current environment in like some in like a higher environment. I think that's how I think that's maybe um, what this picture is trying to show. Um, that makes sense. Um, yeah, let me make a note. Make a note of that. Can dig a little deeper. Okay. So then, moving on to your questions you had earlier, Layla, about uh, bindings for packages. Uh, that question, I think Brett had mentioned, yeah, uh, that um, that error we always get when we load the tidyverse. We have like all those like naming conflicts. Um, that's namespaces is one way to uh, kind of avoid that issue of having ambiguities uh, by a different order in which you have uh, different packages, right? Because if you see here, it's going to take preference. The global environment is going to take preference to whatever is loaded most immediately. And if it only did that in order to find out the names of functions, then you'd have to worry about what order you'd load the packages in in order for R to determine what the uh, what what function should be called. The longer answer is that every package actually has two environments. So the package environment, so that's access accessible to you in the outside world, and then a namespace environment. So it's internal to the package. It's so like all the bindings of the package are also found here. And then it might also have like a few extra names. So like whenever you're calling the function itself, it knows that uh, it knows that the Unless it's mask, it knows that the function you're calling is specific to that package because it's already um, made the binding um, previously. And then another thing that they said was that names are bound to the function, both the package and the namespace environments, but the function specifically sees the namespace. So a picture of that is like the standard deviation function that's in the package called stats. So this picture, at least how I understand it, is that there's a namespace called stats that has the uh, function standard deviation. And what it does is it binds to the imports environment, which is called stats, and that binds to the namespace of the base of base R. And that goes into your global environment. So basically, that's how it ensures that basically it's like a chain. So basically, it ensures that the function standard deviation is coming from the stats package. Um, the imports environment, like I said, like that has all the functions the package needs. Uh, that connects to the base environment and that then connects to the global environment. Combining the two things together, kind of have like this really crazy image of like the whole chain of like everything being bound together um, all the way up. I think for me, like this was a little confusing. So I think the takeaway I got when I was reading more about namespaces is just like this kind of ensures that, like when you're calling a function, that like you're getting what you want, from, not just getting um, a random function from a different package. But you can also be explicit about it um, by using the the two dots, like the. I just type in the chat. If you use the two dots, then you'll also you're also being explicit that way. Like stats filter versus like dplyr filter are just two examples. I think dplyr, if you vote it, it's going to mask the stats filter. And I think that's just so you don't have the naming conflict on there. And like, yeah, that's what the error message tells you as well. Actually, does anybody have, I'm kind of going over this, but does anybody, know why you couldn't just have um i 
actually didn't answer my question. I, my, my question was, is there any way why you couldn't have the same function names when you're loading the packages? But I guess it's because they're they're all in the same environment, like when you're loading them with library. And so you have to be able to differentiate between um, all of them. Like that's why you can't have the same function names because they're all being loaded in the same place. I think if you had different environments, then you wouldn't necessarily have to call them. Yeah, that makes sense, Brett. Yeah. Okay. So then in addition to the execution environment, we also have, sorry, in, in addition to the function environment, we also have what's called the execution environment. So that's uh, made fresh whenever the function is called and its parent is the function environment. Uh, it's also, if you're wrong, that it'll, it'll disappear unless you explicitly do something to save it. Um, so in this case, this actually has, uh, this is next an example of uh, what that execution environment might be. So G is just a function where basically if the current environment doesn't have A, then it's going to just say defining A, and then it's going to define A as one. Or if A is already there, then it'll, um, it'll add one to it, and then it's going to return A. So in this case, it's going to return whatever A is. So in this case, if we just call G, it should return one because the current environment doesn't have one in it, right? But even though we just defined A, if we call it again, because it's starting again, like it's fresh, there's a new environment, it's going to call it, well, there's no change here. Um, basically, I call it again, it's going, to, it's going to continue giving the same output just because there's a new environment every single time. All right. Maybe if I change the two, you'll see. You'll see that it'll change. If you want to actually keep this, there are a few ways to do that. You could actually just return it from the function or you could return an object with the binding to that function. Um, so like a function created inside a function will have the execution environment. So I think this point is it's covered also in the function factory chapter. So we'll also see a little bit more details about uh, what this means. This is a, an example where you could explicitly return the environment from the function. And then this one is like the image down here. This actually actually returns a function that's bound to the execution environment. So this one up here, H2, it actually does an operation based on X and then it returns the current environment. And then this one actually takes whatever the result would be and actually saves it to an object. So if we printed out what the object would be, so for, for E, we'll get what the object, what the environment is for H. But then if we printed out what H was, then we'll see that we'll get, um, we'll get a different environment than what we're actually um, supposed to see. So here we'll see that E, the parent environment, The parent environment matches what H is, and then, so sorry, E has what this environment is. So this current environment inside the function is, that's what this is here, because we're matching it up to E. And then the parent environment is whatever environment that H is actually in, so up top here. So that's one way you can save what the inside is. It's just showing you that E is getting whatever this current environment is inside the function, and then outside the function, so this whole entire box, that's what H is outside here. That's why these two match up, it's just lowercase. Then if we look down here, this kind of confusing diagram kind of just shows you that if you have a function here that had another function inside of it, then you could just have a new function that calls this outer function up here. So if we run this code, we'll see that plus one actually is whatever this thing is here on the inside. And that's what the environment is also of this function, not the outside function, but the inside. So there's just two examples of how you can return the insides of functions, environments. Does that make sense?
I'll take from the silence that maybe, maybe it's a yes. Um, uh, another environment that we have, it's called the color environment. So we saw that it was referenced earlier, I believe it's in the advanced binding section. But basically that's the environment that the function was called from. And it's also where the, the values will be returned to. This is important when we look at what's called a call stack um, because functions can call one another and you wanna know like how they're calling them and the call stack is actually a visual representation of, of how the functions are being called. So they can either be simple, uh, like they're linear or they can not be simple. They have like multiple branches. I'll show you an example of a simple one. So we use this function uh, CST to show you the call stack uh, from the lobster package. There's another um, example uh, from, if you use the like, base R, it's called like trace back, but that has it opposite, it has it flipped. Um, they said that this one is a little bit easier to understand because it, it shows you this function calls this function calls this function instead of this function was called from this function was called from this function. That's the main difference. But if we see here, this function F, it will call G, and then this function G will call H, and then this function H will call the call stack. So if I give an input to F, the result will just show us here that we have the global environment that has F, and then this next step shows us that F calls G and evaluates it at two. Excuse me. And then after it's evaluated at two, then it calls H, which is evaluated at three, which then calls the lobster uh, call stack package. An example of a more complex one that uses lazy evaluation uh, is here. So basically, um, A calls B, then B calls C. And then if we just called A of F, so F from the previous function, like F calling G, calling H, calling whatever, we'll see here that first A is being evaluated, then B is being evaluated, then C is being evaluated. But the important thing to note here is that up until we get to C, that X value isn't actually evaluated. So actually it goes all the way down and then actually evaluates here for C. And then what it does is it takes that uh, value, it comes back up here to X, and then it goes back to this uh, function F. And then it goes down to G, then it goes down to H, then it goes down to the call stack function. So that's kind of how you would read this, kind of like from top to bottom, uh, left to right. And then I guess one branch to a uh, second branch. And then this call stack shows you that the function call, it avoids calling F all the way down until C is needed. And then it comes back up to that um, original uh, function. This shows you the graphical, repre graphical representation of what was just happening up here, um, but it doesn't include the bindings. This is be too messy to show all the bindings here, but this is just a visual rep representation of all of this right here. Every tier of that call stack is called a frame. Uh, and then the frame is characterized by the expression uh, describing the function call and then that environment. Usually it's the execution environment, um, but the environment of the global frame is the global environment. Uh, if you use eval, it can generate frames where the environment is a wild card. So it, it can actually just, uh, you don't have to actually determine what the um, environment is before you do that. And then a parent is actually um, the last thing that characterizes the frame. So like the previous call um, to that specific stack. One last thing, so like I mentioned of dynamic scoping, uh, R doesn't use dynamic scoping. So in other words, if you go back to the previous example of where like the super assignment example, where it showed, where we showed that defining something normally inside a function won't affect everything outside unless you use super assignment. Um, in that case, but dynamic scoping would be like the default behavior is that there's always super assignment inside the function. Like there's no explicit way. There's no, um, you don't have to explicitly tell the function to change everything outside the environment. Um, 
this topic will be covered uh, later in other chapters, but they also mentioned that a lot of languages don't use dynamic scoping just because it would be very confusing to figure out like how functions change if, or how environments change if you were able to um, change things in, uh, without being explicit about it. Uh, another, another thing that was important to note about environments, the last, um, last part of this chapter was that these are the situations where environments are useful. So if you want to avoid copies of large data sets, um, that's why environment might be helpful. Um, or if you want to manage state within the package. So if you want to make sure that things were only changing inside that package, um, or if, yeah, if you weren't trying to uh, manage what was happening inside the package, that's when environment would also be helpful. So kind of going back to the namespace um, example. And then lastly, if you want to access um, data, then you could actually use the environment as a hash map. So it's kind of like a computer science structure where basically you could access it in O of one time, uh, which basically means you could access it fairly quickly. Um, and because environments are already implemented as hash maps, you don't have to create your own hash table. Uh, so just a, for people who might not know, a hash map is just if you have like a key value pair, so basically like one equals apple, two equals banana, et cetera, you could just access all that data by the numbers as opposed to accessing each individual um, element in that, in that list. So you're basically just using numbers in order to, or key value pairs in order to access um, different um, variables in your environment. Basically, so this is a fast way of uh, finding which variables you're using. We actually have an example here. Uh, this shows you how you have an environment and you added something. So a new environment that was just empty, whose parent environment was empty, and then you added A to that environment. You could get the environment from A, um, and you could also set, like make a new, a, uh, set a new value uh, to A using these two functions. Uh, okay. Then I think we have three minutes left. So I just have a few questions from all of that information I went over. I think that question got split off. Oh, there you go. There's actually four ways, but can anybody tell me uh, any different ways that environment is different from a list? Um, in the in the way you can call things from an environment, so lists you can use um, double brackets and indices, I think, versus that has to be named in an environment. There's only like one way, one specific way. Um, the answer they had was that there are four ways. So every object has to have a name and then the order doesn't matter. Every environment has a parent when it's empty. And then every environment has reference semantics, which just means that you can, you don't have, like they just, it doesn't, it modifies um, in place. It doesn't have to copy on modify. Uh, then can I want to say like, what's the global environment? or the only environment that doesn't have a parent? Is that the, the empty environment? Yeah. So the empty, so for the global, uh, the, the parent is always like the last package that's loaded. So it's always like global packages, auto load, base, and then empty. And then the only environment that doesn't have a parent is the empty environment. Um, I actually don't think I went over this one. So the enclosing environment of a function, and why it's important, um, that's just the environment where the function is created. And then that helps you look for where the function looks for variables. Um, anyone know like how would you determine the environment from which a function was called? Uh, 
to either use like collar environment or parent frame. Um, and then lastly, like how like assignment versus super assignment different. We kind of touched on this already. I think it was uh, the assignment always just creates a binding in the current environment. So like it could be like inside a function, but then super assignment, you know, rebinds an existing name. It goes up one step. It just goes up to the parent of the current environment. So that, that might be the global environment or that might be another environment if there's like a, if you have like nested function. So basically it goes up one level. Um, yeah. um, I think that was it for the environment function. Very, very long, very confusing chapter, if you ask me. So thank you for coming along for the ride.